Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah alhamdulillah hamdan yuwafi ni'amahu wa yukafi'u mazidah wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma 'allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima 'allamtana wa zidna 'ilman ya karim rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli rabbi zidni 'ilman rabbi zidni 'ilman rabbi zidni 'ilman اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا Welcome everyone to the second class on the seerah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم بسم الله Today I wanted to discuss another preface to this journey إن شاء الله تعالى so as of yet, we're not getting right into the life of the Prophet ﷺ because there happen to be some very, very key and important points that we need to discuss in order for us to properly understand this life of Rasulullah ﷺ. So in the previous lesson, just to do a quick re recap, we discussed the different religions prior to Rasulullah, the societies prior to Rasulullah ﷺ, or around the same century, and why Allah Azza wa Jal uh, chose the Arabian Peninsula. Inshallah, today I want to talk about the Arabian Peninsula itself and how the Arabs came into this particular peninsula, specifically when it comes to Hijaz and so forth, right? So what exactly is it when we when we say the word Arabian Peninsula, what are we discussing? What are we talking about? Um, firstly, the Arabs like to refer to the Arabian Peninsula as just an Arabian island, okay? Even though it's not an island, but this is how they refer to uh, the peninsula in their language. As a, as a metaphor, because most of the peninsula is in fact surrounded by uh, water, so they refer to it as, a, as an island, even though it's not. That's the important point there, okay? So when you hear Jaziratul Arab, the island of the Arabs, they're not talking about an island, they're talking about the peninsula, which means the water body, the water bodies are all around it, except for one portion of it, which is connected to mainland, right? That's what that means. Kind of like peninsular Malaysia as well, right? Water bodies are all around it, except that it's connected to one, uh, from one angle, it's connected to mainland as well, right? To land as well. So the Arabian Peninsula is the same in that way. Except that the Arabian Peninsula happens to be the largest peninsula in the world, okay? Uh, and when we say the Arabian Peninsula, we're today, from a modern perspective, we're referring to a number of different places, not just modern-day Saudi Arabia. The Arabian Peninsula was inclusive of, uh, historically, Saudi Arabia, it was included, inclusive of Yemen, inclusive of what we know today as Oman, it was inclusive of a number of these different places. All of that would be called Arabia. And in one of the museums that I visited uh, last year, I believe, uh, earlier this year, I found a passport of an individual, uh, I think it was from the 50s or, or 40s or something like that, uh, around that time, uh, that the passport, though the person was born in Yemen, it actually said, born in Arabia, okay? So at some points in history, this entire region was known as Arabia. And people would refer to this particular land, all of it, as uh, as Arabia as well, okay? So that's very important to know because we're going to be discussing Arabia as a whole. All of these different countries that make up what we know today is um, the Arabian, what we know today is the Arabian region, all of them will be with our, within our discussions when we talk about the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A few major areas in which there happened to be civilization in Arabia during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam happened to be A, Al-Hijaz. Okay? Al-Hijaz, when we say Al-Hijaz, we're referring to the western side, uh, northwestern side of the Arabian Peninsula. Okay? It covers a very major landmass included, include, included in there is uh, Central Arabia as well, the western part of it. Uh, which happens to have uh, Mecca and Medina and so forth, right? And beyond as well, okay? That's the first major point that 
uh, or first major area that's important to us. Why? Because of course, a lot of the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Al-Hijaz itself, and then it expanded out to other places as well, okay? Then we have something called Tihama, which is also on the western side, except that it happens to be in the southern western side, but not right to the south, um, from the central to the, uh, to the southern uh, area, okay? But not right to the south, because when we get right to the south, then we'll have Yemen there, okay? And then, of course, it brings us to the third point, which is Yemen, which is the southern side, more so in the west than the east, okay? Then we have central, central land, which is known as Najd. And the word Najd literally means a high place, okay? Uh, and if you've been to the central region of uh, the Arabian Peninsula, you'll know that it's quite high. In order for you to get to it, you actually have to drive up a very, very high, uh, you know, very steep sort of road. And not just once, a couple of times, if you actually are trying to get to Riyadh, you might, you might have to drive, drive a height once, and then you have to go again. And a few miles later, you go up another big hill, and then you are finally in Riyadh if you're coming from Mecca, right? But again, the way I'm describing all this, I'm not describing it as the map, modern map has it. I'm describing it as the historic map used to be, okay? Because all of this was one area called Arabia, and then within that were different regions. Uh, what they would refer to as provinces, perhaps, okay? Or states, or uh, something similar to that. Um, and then you have Al-Arud, another region, and that's the last most important and significant one. One of the most important and significant ones. So these five regions. Al-Arud is on the east, within which happened to be uh, a lot of the eastern side of Arabia, and within which happened to be what we know today as, um, what we call today Bahrain, but Bahrain is also inclusive of not just the islands, but the mainland as well, in historical historic Arabia. This is a little bit about the uh, geography of uh, Arabia. Now, how is this land? How many of you have first of all been to Arabia? You might have went to Hajj or Umrah or uh, Mecca any time in your life. Okay, have you been? Uh, has anyone been there? No. Okay. Well, let me tell you a little bit about um, the the region. Okay, uh, you're talking about a landmass which is massively uh, a desert, a largely a desert. Okay, largely a desert land. A lot of it still till today happens to be not inhabited by anybody, okay? Much of the Arabian Peninsula till today, there are no people to live there. Why? Because people can't live there, uh, uh, considering the circumstances uh, that uh, most of Arabia, uh, the geological circumstances of most of Arabia, it's all sand, okay? Desert sand. Uh, at least a fourth, what they call a rub al khali, the fourth empty area of uh, of Arabia, is as it's called a quarter which is empty in Arabia. There's really nothing there. There's no people there. There might be, uh, you know, animals and and so forth and desert uh, life. In, but other than that, there's nothing there. If you go in here, you might die. People go in here. They try to you know, pull a stunt and try to stay there for the night or so on and so forth, and their GPS stops working, and, and then after several months, some rescue uh, commission finds them dead, uh, uh, you know, in this region because they had no access, access to telephones, they had no access to anything. This is uh, a large portion of Arabia until today, okay? So sand and, and desert sand and sand dunes, this is part of life in, in Arabia. Now, of course, current day Arabia has... Uh, caught up to civilization, or civilization has caught up to it, and that's why you find uh, very, very urbanized cities as well within Arabia. Uh, so much so that within Arabia today, you might find cities which are more civilized and more uh, urbanized than some of the most advanced countries in the world as well. So there's a bit of a duality. You might have uh, areas which no one can live in, no one can reside in, no one can even go there except that there's a danger that they may get lost and die, and then there's regions where uh, you have um, civilization, every single thing that civil, modern civilization has to offer, okay? So this is a little bit about uh, Arabia today, but if we look yesterday, modern civilization in 6th and 7th century Arabia hadn't caught up to, 
whatever was modern at that time, hadn't caught up to this particular land. And that's why you had people who were pretty much nomadic. What that means is every single time they would find water and hay for their animals, they would go and, and live there. When this finishes, the water, then they would pack their bags up, pack their tents up, and they would walk somewhere else until they find water and, and uh, a place for their animals to graze in as well. Right? That's what Arabia looked like yesterday. And because of that, you did not have any signs of an empire within Arabia, with the exception of uh, Yemen. And the reason for that is because that empire, uh, before the birth of Rasulullah was an extension of the Christian Abyssinian Empire. Okay, But other than that, you had no signs of any uh, civilization within this uh, any um, development within this particular region. You had people living uh, nomadic lifestyles, but in terms of a complete civilization, you know, buildings and so forth. At that point in history, there was no signs of this. Before that, yes, there were signs. Uh, and I'll discuss that uh, as well in a minute, inshallah. And these people were used to combat and fights and uh, problems so considering that people who were civilized many of them didn't want to live within this region as well they would go and find themselves uh, an external place uh, to live in to avoid the wars and to avoid all of these uh, the bloodshed and so on and so forth but along with the bloodshed that's why i said there's a duality in the society there is bloodshed there is wars there is uh, pride that leads to uh, all of these nasty things but at the same time there is also trustworthiness meaning if you give if you give your word to someone that person will fulfill their words they might uh, you know they might not they might not enjoy they might not um, deal with you too well if you do something wrong to them but if they've given you their word they will stick to their word they, they, they will fulfill their trust. They will fulfill friendships as well. You have a friendship with someone, the person will be willing to die for that friendship. So there's this duality within this society. Now, Arabs can be divided into three categories as it's been done by historians. Now we're moving on from uh, the geological and civilizational perspectives to, a, uh, to, to looking at the Arabs themselves. You can divide them into three categories. You have the first category, which are known as Arab Ba'idah. These Arabs are the very, very early Arabs who cease to exist now. Okay? They're known as, and their children and their lineage and so on and so forth. We don't know exactly what happened to these people, except the fact that we have within the Quran, uh, ayat telling us that a adab from Allah Azza wa Jal had come to some of these people and, uh, and if we look at the word Arab Ba'idah it means the ones who have finished they have uh, they have uh, been annihilated almost right these are a number of different tribes and a number of different people including whom happen to be the people of Hud alayhi salam who are known as Had okay who are in the southern region in Arabia, in Yemen, in Ahqaf, in modern day Yemen, in Ahqaf, which is not too far from Hadramaut. Okay? What, what happened to these people? Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran that Allah Azza wa sent upon them a, a, a very severe wind which caused uh, them to completely be swallowed almost by the land. Okay? They were uh, covered by a desert storm that came, and, and there is no signs of them. Uh, anymore they cease to ex exist and they're of course children and so on and so forth everyone got buried within the land uh, and their dwellings are not too far from what we know today as modern day Hadramaut. okay this is arab ba'idah these are arabs who uh, cease to exist today and also their lineage ceases to exist as well okay now these people the question that we have about these people is was their Arabic the same as the Arabic of the later Arabs? And those are the next category that I'll mention, who are known as Arab Ariba, Arabs who, ha who are absolutely Arab. The early Arabs who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed in this uh, incident with Ad, the people of Hud, 
the language of these people, is it the same as the language of the later people? This is a, a question that never really was there uh, until, well, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Their language is not the same as the language of the later Arabs. It's, a, it's slightly different. It is somehow connected, etymologically speaking, the words and the development of the language, they're etymologically connected, but they don't, they're not one and the same, okay? They're not one and the same. And the Quran was revealed not by the language of these early Arabs who are known as Arab Ba'idah, Arab who have, uh, you, you, who do not exist anymore. Uh, it was rather revealed by the language of the later Arabs. This is very important to note because some of the researchers today, they say that the Arabic language of the Quran is actually the language of these people of Ad and so forth, people of Hud and so forth. Why do they say this? When they say this, then they disconnect you from all of the literature of pre-Islamic Arabia. Because then they say this literature is not useful in understanding the Quran because of the fact that the language of the Quran is actually that of the Arab who were before uh, the pre-Islamic Arabians. But we say no, the language of the Quran is actually that language that was there at the time that the Prophet ﷺ was sent. Which is the language of the Arab Ariba and Arab Musta'riba. And that brings me to the third category of the Arabians. So you have Arab Ba'idah. They were extinguished. They're no longer existing. Then you had Arab Ariba. These are people who uh, were the dwellers of Yemen, largely known as the Qahtaniyun. Okay. Then you have a third category. These are Arab Musta'riba. These are the ones who were in Mecca. And why are they called Musta'riba? Musta'riba means those who gained Arabness. Okay. How did they gain Arabness? Well, because the Arab Ariba, the original Arabs, they uh, married into uh, Ismail alayhi salam when he moved with his father to Mecca as he grew old. He married from the tribe of Jurhum. And the people who were born to this particular uh, wedlock, their children are known as Arab Musta'riba, those who gained the Arabness, okay? All of them are considered Arab, but it's important to divide this in, in, in this way because of reasons we'll find out, inshallah, as we're reading through the seerah, inshallah. Because some of them happen to be from the second category in the seerah from the Sahaba, some of them happen to be from the third category. And the Prophet ﷺ happens to be from the third uh, of the three categories that I gave, right? And uh, this brings me to my third point, okay? And this is also a very important point and very unique point. And this gives you another uh, window into why Allah Azza wa Jal sent the Prophet to Arabia specifically. Arabia is a very, very large region, okay? A very large region. It's actually a lot larger than it seems on Google Maps, okay? If you were to go look at Google Maps, because it falls in the middle of the map, uh, it's naturally made smaller, right? Because the type of system that's used uh, to map the world today makes all of the all of the lands that are uh, in the middle of the map, it makes them look smaller than the ones that are in the north and the ones that happen to be in the south. If you were to take Saudi Arabia, for instance, which is not all of Arabia, but only part of it, and you take it to the north, it will be as large as Greenland. So it's a very large region, if you consider all of Arabia. Now in a land this big, which can fit at least two Nigerias or th maybe three Nigerias within it, right? You have all of this region speaking just one language. All of this region is just speaking one language. Now, you may say, well, we speak one language. Most of us speak English. Uh, many of us, speak, all of us pretty much speak, uh, with the exception of myself, Malay, right? Uh, and, uh, and maybe all of Malaysia, we have people that can communicate with each other with, in one language. Now, this is in modern times, right? Historically, we did not have exchange of civilization the way we do today. We didn't have television. We didn't have a, unifi a unified schooling system. We didn't have all these things. So every tribe, every region would have their own language. But in Arabia, all of Arabia happens to be speaking one language. Today, in the world, there
happens to be over 7,000 languages that are still alive. Okay, people still, uh, the people are still speaking. And in Africa alone, there happens to be almost 2,000 languages, okay, or more. And in Nigeria alone, there happens to be over 500 languages. And that's why I was mentioning Nigeria earlier on, that in Saudi Arabia alone, you could probably fit, fit more than two Nigerias, okay? Not all of Arabia, because all of Arabia, you can probably put three, maybe four uh, Nigerias. So in Nigeria alone today, there is about 500 different languages that people speak. There are, of course, languages that unify everyone, that so people can communicate with one another, but every region, every tribe, you have a different language. In Arabia, people in the north, people in the south, people in the west, everyone can communicate with one, one another. Think about that for a second. That makes it very, very easy for the da'wah to spread. That's not the case if you go take it to another region. In Europe, even at that time, people didn't have a unified language. So until today, people don't. And because of that, uh, it would be difficult for the, a call to spread within this region at that time, especially where you didn't have a unifying language such as English or any other major languages of the world, right? So in Arabia, all the people, north, south, east, west, everyone is speaking the same language, languages, even though you would imagine that they wouldn't do that. Why? Because A, they're uh, nomadic. So that means that they don't have cultural exchange too much. B, um, oftentimes the reason why they can't uh, have cultural exchange is because of the 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 way the the geological um, the, the way the Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has made this land. You have mountains in between the Hama and uh, and uh, what, east of it. You have uh, Medina itself is surrounded by three mountains. You have all these different reasons why people cannot travel to one another. So you'd imagine people would form their own languages, but no, Allah Azza wa Jal allowed at that moment in history for these people to have a unifying tongue. Okay? That's something very, very unique. Uh, this Jazeera, this uh, Arabian Peninsula, is mentioned, uh, by, and the people of it have been mentioned by historians uh, before Islam as well. So, for example, we have mention of uh, the Arabs and uh, different uh, cultural practices of the Arabs by Ptolemy himself, who died in the year 160, who was, of course, uh, a very important um, uh, philosopher of Alexandria, right? And you have uh, a lot of mention of Arabia and Arabs as well in Christian literature. You also have... You also have... Uh, Diodorus, who is a Greek historian of Sicily, um, who died in the year 30 before Christ, he says about Arabs in Arabia, and I mentioned this point yesterday, but just to reiterate it. Uh, he says they love freedom. They love freedom, uh, and they choose to live a style in which the only thing that's covering them is the sky, meaning nomadic lifestyle. And then he reiterates again, they love to make their decisions on their own and they love absolute freedom. So these people, they loved uh, freedom uh, as opposed to the rest of the world at that time. Okay, as I described to you before, uh, the uh, Sassanids, they, the, the, the citizens over there, they would almost refer to their uh, leaders as gods, as I, as I said to you, uh, you know, shared with you some of the other civilizations. Uh, of the past as well, of that particular era, most of the people of the world did not have freedom. Whereas Arabians had freedom. This was one of the things that made them, uh, set them apart from uh, the rest of the world, okay? Arab lands and Arabia in general was also connected to a number of the past prophets as well, okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent more than one prophet to this region. Allah tells us, of course, of Ad, who I described to you earlier, who are in the southern region of Arabia, in modern day Yemen, close to Hadramaut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Remember the brother of Ad. Who's the brother of Ad? A'i Hud alayhi salam. Remember Hud, if anzara qawmahu bil When he warned his people in al-ahqaf. 
وَقَدْ خَلَتِ النُّذُرُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ And before him and after him, messengers had already come. Look at that. So Allah is saying Hud was sent to Ad. And remember when Hud warned Ad, who were Arabians, and he says, he says that before him and after him, there was also uh, messengers that had come, right? Allah ta'budu illallah inni akhafu alaykum adhaba yawmin azim. Do not worship anyone but Allah Azza wa Jal. I am fearful of a very severe torment that may come your direction. Okay, this is one example of a prophet that had come to Arabia. Similarly, we have Salih alayhi salam, right? And uh, the remains of the civilization of Thamud to whom Salih alayhi salam was sent is there till today. You can go uh, visit when you're visiting Saudi Arabia. If you are, you can go to a place between uh, Tabuk and between Medina, literally almost center uh, between these two. So on the northern side of this place is Tabuk, and on the southern side is Medina, a place that is known as Madain Salih. Okay, Madain Salih is uh, a place which is there for you to see till today. The civilization of Thamud, how they lived, what they, uh, what their houses were, what like what their um, dwellings were like. And there's also documentaries online that you can watch at least to get an idea of how their dwellings used to be. So this was a place to whom a prophet of Allah Azza wa was sent in Arabia as well by the name of Salih alayhi salam. Another one is of course Ismail, who is uh, the father of the Adnani Arabs, right? Because he was the one who married into Jurum and then from there came uh, you know, his progeny from whom was Adnan and then from whom was of course Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well, right? Uh, so you have a number of prophets that have been sent to this region. Another pointer that's really unique about this region is that this idea of freedom was perhaps there before as well, uh, in that you had a number of prophets who almost sought refuge in Arabia, okay? Or a number of people who had sought refuge in Arabia, not just prophets, but people as well. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Firstly, you had uh, Musa alayhi salam as well, himself, as, as he fled uh, to Madian, right? And according to some accounts, Madian actually happens to be uh, part of larger Arabia, okay? So if that's the case, then you would have uh, Musa alayhi salam fleeing to this region. Why? Because he's trying to seek protection. Then <clears throat> you have uh, a number of Jews who were persecuted in, uh, in, in where they come from by the Romans. They've been persecuted. So they fled to Yathrib and they fled to parts of Yemen as well and settled down there. So you had uh, these Jews who couldn't find another place to settle in because of the fact that they were being persecuted. So they fled to Arabia to seek shelter, okay, and safe haven. And also some Christians who were also persecuted by the Romans as well. They fled to a place not too far from Yemen today, Najran as well, okay. They had fled to Najran, which was historically part of Yemen, by the way, okay. Uh, so you see this idea of people having the opportunity to do really whatever they want, except if you come in the face of someone else, then you have to get yourself prepared for war. This is how the life is in Arabia, in early Arabia, okay? Ismail alayhi salam, as I mentioned a few times, moved with his father uh, and his mother to Mecca as he was still a young uh, baby, okay? Ibrahim alayhi salam settled down Ismail alayhi salam in Mecca uh, and uh, of course with his mother as well. And he went on after leaving them here in Mecca, which was an absolute barren line, and I'll come to that in a second. He went off to his da'wah. Then he spent many, many years whilst Ismail was being raised up in this region. He spent his time giving da'wah to Allah Azza wa Jal, traveling to one place, from one place to another, and so on and so forth. Until finally Ibrahim alayhi salam came back and he settled back in Mecca as well where they built the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, which we know as al kaaba right? They both uh, gathered together to build this house. And Allah Azza wa Jal describes this uh, to us in the Quran when he says, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Remember when Ibrahim alayhi salam was building the foundations of this Kaaba. He was building the foundations of this house of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
And they were, and Ismail as well. And they were saying, Oh Allah, accept from us, you are the ever hearing, and you are the ever knowing as well. So Allah reminds us of this particular story where Ibrahim and Ismail are gathering together to build this house, to which, by the way, we have people going to till today, right? Hundreds of thousands, millions of people. The largest gathering congregation in the world takes place where? It takes place in Mecca, right? People go there. This is the single Hajj, is the single largest event that takes place every single year in the world, okay? And this, of course, is part of the dua that that Ibrahim alayhi salam made. And I'll get to that dua in just a minute. But one of the duas Ibrahim alayhi salam had made was this. And Ismail as well. Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolan minhum. Oh Allah, first of all, make a make a ummah muslima over here for you. An ummah which is submitting to your, you, O oh Allah azza wa jal, over here. Right? Rabbana waj'alna muslimayni laka. Oh Allah, make us to Ibrahim and Ismail uh, people who happen to be Muslims and make from our progeny also people who happen to be Muslims as well and teach us how to do the rites and rituals of, of Al-Hajj as well. Then he makes another dua and he says, Oh Allah, bring within them a messenger. Yatlu alayhim ayatik. He recites upon you, uh, upon them, your ayat, O oh Allah. And he teaches them your book, O oh Allah Azza wa Jal. And he teaches them the hikmah and the wisdom as well. And he purifies them. You, O oh Allah, are ever capable. And you, O oh Allah, are ever wise. You, O oh Allah, are ever mighty. And you, O oh Allah, are ever wise. So who is he talking about here? When he says, O oh Allah, send a Muslim, a messenger. He's speaking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's speaking about our Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. Okay, so this dua of Ibrahim was accepted then. Allah Azza wa Jal sent a messenger amidst the progeny of Ibrahim and Ismail. The dua of both Ibrahim and Ismail together uh, got accepted. And another dua that Ibrahim made, Allah tells us in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim itself, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ جَعَلْ هَذَا الْبَلَدَ آمِنًا O oh Allah, Ibrahim when he said, remember O oh Muhammad, when Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Oh my Lord, make this land a peaceful land, a land in which there happens to be peace. Protect me and my children from worshipping the idols. Oh Allah, he continues, they have misled many, many people. He said, Oh Allah, they, these idols, have misled many, many people. So Ibrahim alayhi salam recalled all of the incidents within which these idols had misled many, many people. And he made dua to Allah azza wa jal to protect himself and his progeny from worshipping other than Allah azza wa jal. Worshipping these idols. Then he says, Rabbana. By the way, this is a very, very important point. Every time I read this verse, I think about uh, a lot of different ideas. And I really get stuck at this particular dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Look at what he says. He says, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati. Oh Allah, I have taken my family and I've placed them in a place where there is nothing at all. Inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri di zara'in. Inda baytika al-muharram. Oh Allah, I've taken my family and I've placed them in a place where there happens to be no vegetation at all. There happens to be no agricultural uh, you know, facilities at all and produce at all. But I have done so because I'm placing them next to your house, which is very, very sacred. So Ibrahim alayhi salam moved his family for the sake of Allah to a place which had nothing in it, absolutely barren land. Okay. And nowadays, we often are looking to move ourselves from a situation to another simply for the sake of the dunya. Here is Ibrahim alayhi salam. He is placing his family in a situation where there happens to be absolutely nothing at all. No vegetation, no water, no nothing. But he knew that Allah azza wa will be looking after this family. So he did that and Allah azza wa gave him what? Allah azza wa accepted his next dua. Now he says, why am I doing all this? Why am I placing my family in this situation? 
رَبَّنَا لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ I'm doing this, O oh Allah, so my family may be able to do what? Pray to you, O oh Allah, Rabbul Izzati wa Jalla. So that ability to worship Allah Azza wa Jalla freely was so important to Ibrahim alayhi salam that he took his family and placed them in a place where there is no civilization, there is no vegetation, there is no water, but he wants to make sure that one thing is fulfilled, and that is the rights of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And that is the worship of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. Rabbana li yuqeemu salat. Faj'al af'idatan min al-nasi tahwi ilayhim. Warzuquhum min al-thamarat. So, O oh Allah, make hearts from the people, turn to them, and give them also the fruits as well. Okay? Now, that barren land, Mecca, or Bakka, where Ibrahim alayhi salam had placed his child and um, and Hajar, uh, Hajar as well in Mecca, absolutely barren, no vegetation, no signs of water. What do you have over there now? You have everything that the world has to offer, right? And the dua that Ibrahim salam made became accepted. Oh Allah, make hearts from the people turn towards them. How many hearts turn towards Mecca on a daily basis today? If people are doing their job right, at least 1.6 billion hearts turn towards Mecca on a daily basis, right? We all turn towards Mecca uh, for our salah. And how many hearts, how many hearts turn physically towards Mecca on a yearly basis in the millions without a doubt? Millions of people frequent Mecca. Uh, uh, all of this because of the, after the will of Allah Azza wa because of the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that, oh Allah, make hearts from the people, turn towards the people, and give them all types of fruits. Now, because of the fact that people are coming in such large numbers to, to Mecca, uh, basically anything that the world has to offer immediately gets to Mecca. Okay? Anything. It, it may get delayed from other parts of Arabia, but Mecca specifically because people are frequenting there. So there's tijara happening as well. There's also, uh, you know, sales and, and business taking place here as well. So people will be frequenting and they'll be bringing along with them all sorts of goodies and, and, and fruits and every single thing. So everything can be found within the city that was absolutely barren. Why? Because the niyyah, the intention of Ibrahim alayhi salam was that great and that accurate. Okay. So Ismail who settled down and then he got married into Jurhum is the father then of the Adnani Arabs. Okay, the Adnani Arabs. From Adnan came a man, by the, from the children of Adnan came a man by the name of Fihir ibn Malik. Okay, who is Fihir? <coughs> Fihir is the original name of the person we know as Quraysh. Okay. So basically all of the children of Fihir are known as the Qurashi Arabs, okay? That's the original name. And that's why when we look at the lineage of the Prophet Wasallam, within that lineage comes also Fihir as well. Ghalib ibn Fihir. And I'll give you the lineage of Rasulullah Wasallam in a minute as well. And then from the children of Fihir, this particular individual who was a very, very... Um, famous uh, individual within the Arabs came a man by the name of Qusay ibn Kila. This Qusay, his name, original name was Zayd. Okay? Qusay ibn Kila. Qusay ibn Kila became really, really important in that a lot of uh, Arabs, even till later, continued to look to him and his opinions because he had gained a very, very uh, uh, noble opinion of the Arabs. Okay. Now, when Ismail had passed away, who was taking care of the Kaaba and everything related to the Kaaba? The first child of uh, one of the children of Ismail himself. Then what happened? Then all of the tasks related to the Kaaba, which happened to be a the Sidana al Bayt which means taking care of the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, having the key to the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, opening the door to the Kaaba, closing the door to the Kaaba, taking care of the um, taking care of the cloth, the kiswa of the Kaaba, and also washing the Kaaba. All of these duties uh, can be summarized under the word Sidana. Okay, so the Sidana to the Bayt at that time 
was right away given to the child of Ismail. Okay, then it was taken by Jubhum, the tribe of Jubhum, to whom Ismail السلام, had married with, right? From whom Ismail السلام, had married a woman. Okay, then it stayed with these people until finally it got to uh, a point where Khuza'a took it away from Khuza'a or another tribe. They took it away from Jurhum and they started taking care of the house of Allah Azza wa They started taking care of another important task which is the Siqaya to Zamzab, which is uh, allowing people to drink Zamzab, okay? They started taking care of this. Prior to that, who was taking care of it? Jurhum. Then it went to Khuza'a. Then when it came time for it to come back to the uh, tribe of Quraysh, it went to Qusay bin Kilab. That's why he became a very, very famous and important person. Qusay bin Kilab started to do all of the major tasks around Mecca. He had Sidanat al-Bayt, meaning he was the one who was taking care of the Kaaba itself. He was the one who uh, would do the siqaya to Zamzam, meaning that anyone that wanted to drink Zamzam, it was actually the water now of Qusay bin Kilab. Okay, you had to go through Qusay in order for you to get your water. Similarly, Rifada, a third very noble and important task in Mecca. Rifada meant that people who are coming as the guests of Allah Azza wa Jal to Mecca, you feed them food, right? You be kind to them. So all of these tasks were taken up by Qusay ibn Kilab. He's got the Sidana, he's got the Siqaya, and he's got the Rifada. He's the one that's the caretaker of the Kaaba. He's the one who takes care of the well of Zamzam. He's the one who feeds people when they come for Hajj as well. Okay? So because of this, people thought this guy is really the most important Arab we've known because all of the Fada'il, all of the virtues of Mecca have been given to this person, Qusay ibn Kilab. Right? And in addition to that, they had something similar to uh, the parliament. Okay, They would have something similar to that, uh, which would be a nadwa, a club in which all of the elites get together and they discuss the matters of society. So that's where they do their shura. That's where they do their council. Okay, So this particular task was also given to Qusay ibn Kilab now. On top of that, he was the one who had the flag in, in battles as well. So when you, they would go for battle, he would be the person that would be the flag bearer. He can give it to someone else he wants, if he wants. But that means that all of the sharaf of Mecca, all of the grace in Mecca is gathered together in this one person by the name of Qusay ibn Kilab. Within, within the children of Qusay ibn Kilab, a man by the name of Abdu Manaf became also very noble. Okay? And uh, so, so some of these tasks were handed over then to Abdul Manaf. Specifically, his child Hashim was given these tasks as well. Okay, Hashim. And so it continued downwards until it got to Abdul Muttalib himself. Okay, and this is how we can see that the Prophet ﷺ had a very, very noble lineage that, that we're talking about. All the names that I've mentioned, now I'll tell you the lineage of Rasulullah ﷺ, and you'll find many of these names within the lineage of the Messenger ﷺ. So you have Muhammad ibn Abdullah, ibn Abdul Muttalib, Muhammad, the child of Abdullah, the child of Abdul Muttalib. Already you have Abdul Muttalib. Right, who was the last person to whom the siqaya and the rifada was given? The last person to whom the uh, task of uh, dealing with zamzam and also taking care of the hujjaj when they come was given. Right, so that's the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ibn Hashim, Ibn Abdi Manaf, Ibn Qusayi, Ibn Kilab. Right, so a very very noble lineage in the eyes of the Arabs at that time and also. Uh, to Allah Azza wa Jal as well. How do we know that? We know that because the Prophet told us in a hadith that in Allah astafa kinana. Allah Azza wa Jal chose kinana uh, from the children of Ismail alayhi salam. And from him, Allah Azza wa Jal chose Qurayshan, meaning Fihr, uh, and the children of Fihr. 
right? Min Kinana. Wastafa min Quraysh in Bani Hashim. From Quraysh, Allah Azza wa Jal chose specifically Banu Hashim, right? Who is uh, the great grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hashim himself. And Allah Azza wa Jal chose me from Banu Hashim. Uh, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is then a chosen person from a mist, the chosen from a mist, the chosen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send the peace and blessings to, upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the last point that I want to discuss today, uh, or the second last point, is how this particular great area within which Ibrahim Ismail settled down and Ismail's progeny uh, remains till uh, today actually. How did suddenly this place which was completely on Tawheed and Ibrahim had made the dua that they, the people of this area remain on Tawheed, how suddenly did this place become filled with mushrikeen? People who are pagans, people who are polytheists, right? How did that happen? How did that take place? Well, to understand that, we have to understand the event that took place not too far before uh, the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What I mean to say is it wasn't several centuries before, okay? Because remember, um, that... Arabia was generally upon the Tawheed of Ibrahim. But a man by the name of Amr ibn Luhay came about within Arabia and he traveled to a place called Asham, okay? Syria today. And when he traveled to this place, within this place, in some of his travels, specifically he went to a place, according to some historians, by the name of Petra. Okay, Batra. All right, this place is there in Jordan till today. Okay, and you can see a lot of um, historic uh, sites in this place as well. So he went to Petra, and whilst there, he got affected by the idol worship that was there. Okay, and it is said that a lot specifically came from Petra as well, okay? Allah is one of the idols that the polytheists in Arabia really used to glorify, and that's why Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, the person we talked about yesterday, right? Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, who was the own, one of the only monotheists in Arabia, he said, I left Lat and I left Uzza. أَزَلْتُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّى جَمِيعًا كَذَلِكَ يَفْعَلُ الْجَلِيدُ الصَّبُورُ I left Lat and I've left Uzza. That's how a perseverant and patient man does. Okay? So he left worshipping Lat and he left worshipping Al-Uzza. So Lat is a very important idol to the Arabians, right? Where did this Lat come from? Some of them said it came from also Asham and specifically from Petra of all, place, uh, of all places, right? On one of the journeys of Amr ibn Luhayy. He picked up this uh, new culture of worship and so on and so forth. He brought it along with them, to, with him to Arabia and slowly but surely people fell for it and people began to worship other than Allah Azza wa Jal in Arabia despite the fact that Ismail alayhi salam and Ibrahim had done everything within their capacity to ensure their progenies uh, remain upon uh, right guidance. Now of course the guidance came back. Allah Azza wa Jal sent uh, a messenger thereafter, right? Now... The Arabians, as I mentioned before, they slowly started to worship not just the one idol that was brought from Asham, but they started to worship everything. So much so that they would now, some of them would even worship the, the, the seed inside of a date. They would pick it up and they would make an idol out of the seeds of the date and they would start worshiping them. And then when they're, you know, they, they would check it out on their travels or so on and so forth. And sometimes they would take the dates themselves and worship them. And when they're hungry, they would just eat the dates and throw them away, right? So this is the type of jahala, this is the type of ignorance that these, some of these people had gotten to, right? And some of them would take the rocks in the haram and they would take it with them in their journey as well, okay? So they would think that the rocks of the haram have some special quality. And by the way, some of the ignorant Muslims still today do, do this practice. They go to the haram and on the way back they pick up a rock from the haram, right? They bring a rock back with them from the haram. 
and they say, oh, this is, you know, I got this rock from the haram, this pebble from the haram. This is not something that is allowed. It's impermissible to do this. In fact, Imam al-Shafi'i himself, he said that in taking, uh, taking the rocks out of the haram or the dirt of the haram, taking it out of the haram, because it is known that that particular land is considered uh, sacred by Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. And I don't think it's permissible to take that sacred uh, land, uh, rocks and pebbles and dirt out of it and place it in a place which doesn't happen to have that same sort of sacredness. So this is considered impermissible. And this was one of the practices that the pagans of Arabia did as well. Along with them in their journey, they would take rocks from the Haram and uh, you know, slowly but surely they started to get, get connected to these rocks more than they were connected to uh, Allah Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal himself. Okay. And the last point, of course, is the Hadithatul Feed. Okay. Now we know a little bit about Arabia. We know about the geology of Arabia. We know about the geography of, of Arabia as well, inshallah, a little bit. Now, how did or when did the birth of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam occur? Okay. In the year in which the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam occurred, there were some precursors to this birth. Okay. One of those major precursors was the famous story of the people of the elephant. Okay. What's the story of the people of the elephant? It goes as such that a king by the name of Abraha had uh, come from Yemen. Remember, I told you. Uh, Yemen was one of the only places where there actually happened to be civilization, uh, very, you know, uh, acceptable level of civilization, right? Why? Because it was an extension to the Abyssinian uh, Christian empire, okay? So Abraha came and he was the, the person who was placed by the Abyssinian to take care of Yemen, right? The king. So he comes to Mecca. But why does he come to Mecca? He comes to Mecca because the Haram was the place, Kaaba was the place that most people would travel to if they wanted to worship, if they wanted to make Hajj, if they wanted to make a pilgrimage. Right? We make Hajj and we go to the Kaaba. Isn't that so? Other religions, by the way, they have their own forms of pilgrimages as well, right? So people do travel to other places for their type of Hajj as well, okay? So in Arabia, everyone that wanted to make Hajj, they would travel to Kaaba. Now, in Yemen, this person, Abraha, had made a church and called it al Qulays. Slowly but surely, this church started to gain a lot of attention and people started to go over here. So one of the people from Arabia didn't like this so much. So what did he do? He went to the church and... He, uh, you know, um, he defecated in this church. And that, of course, led to Abraha becoming very angry that you've made my church filthy, you've done this or you've done that. So he said, I'm going to go to war against the people of Arabia and I'm going to destroy this house as well, the Kaaba. So he takes an army and he goes to Arabia. And as he is coming to Arabia on the way, you know, uh, Abdul Muttalib's camels, many of them, 200 of the camels of Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Rasulullah wasallam, get taken by this man, Abraha, as war booty. Okay? So Abdul Muttalib goes to Abraha and he says to him that I have to ask you something. Now, Abdul Muttalib is like the leader of Mecca at that time, right? So when Abraha uh, sees Abdul Muttalib, he feels uh, the type of haiba, the type of uh, aura that you'd feel from a leader, right? And he actually gets off of his chair, his high chair, and comes down to meet Abdul Muttalib. When Abdul Muttalib asked him what he wanted, suddenly Abraha changes his mind. He said, I used to think you're a man who's a very great man, but now I've realized otherwise. What was the question that Abdul Muttalib asked? He said, all I want from the king, who is the Abyssinian king, uh, the Yemeni, the Abyssinian person who's been installed almost in Yemen, right? All I want from you is, I want you to go 
and give me my 200 camels back. Now Abraha says, you know, you're going to leave your forefathers and you're going to leave your the, the house of your Lord and you're going to leave all of these things and you're going to ask me about 200 camels? That's it? That's all you're going to be asking me? Right? I thought you're going to come and tell me not to destroy the Kaaba, Right? So Abdul Muttalib says, Inni Rabbul, Inni Ana Rabbul Ibil. I am the Lord of these uh, camels. Now, the word Rabb uh, doesn't necessarily mean Lord by the meaning of God. Okay, sometimes it's used as caretaker. Okay, <clears throat> and even in English, by the way, sometimes the word Lord is used as someone who looks after things. Like in England, they have the House of Lords, right? They don't mean gods. Okay, so. He said, Inni ana rabbul ibil. I am the owner, let's put it this way, of these ibil, the caretaker of these ibil, of these camels. And there happens to be a lord of the house as well. He will take care of that and he will protect that. So Abraha became really arrogant at that point and he said there's no way he's going to be able to protect this house from me okay i'm going to destroy this house so abdul muttalib simply said anta wadak you deal with that that's your problem because i know we know that allah azza wa will take care of this house so now abdul muttalib got his camels back he went back to mecca and him and a number of the arabians they uh, leaders especially they went to the Kaaba and they started making dua to Allah Azza wa remember they still had the concept of Allah yes they are uh, associating partners with Allah Azza wa but they definitely had the concept of Allah <coughs> from the deen of Ibrahim alayhi so they made dua they made dua to Allah Azza wa and now as Abraha is proceeding Mecca his uh, his elephant stopped his feel his elephant stopped it wouldn't go further so they tried to move it, they tried to kick it, they tried to get it to move, it's not moving. It wouldn't go, proceed towards, it wouldn't proceed towards Mecca. So now, what happened? They tried to take it the other direction and suddenly it started to go really, really fast. And at that moment, Allah Azza wa Jal, so every time that they would try to bring it towards Mecca, it would stop. Every time they would try to, make it go back towards Yemen, it would start you know, going really fast, proceeding really fast. So at that point, Allah Azza wa Jal sent upon these people uh, the Tayran Ababil. Allah sent birds which happened to have rocks within their claws, right? And then they started throwing these rocks at the people one after another after another. And this partic particular story is actually captured in the Quran as well. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent rocks upon these people one after another and it killed many of them. Abraha was saved for a little while but he was also struck. <coughs> On the way back to Yemen, Abraha started to have a slow and painful death. One portion of his body after another started to literally fall apart until finally when they got back to Yemen, uh, he had completely finished and he had died. Uh, and he died over there, okay? Then we <clears throat> noticed that after this incident, the Quraysh became even more prevalent and important to the Arabs because already they thought because of Qusay ibn Kilab getting back all of the, the sharaf, the honor of Mecca from Khuza'a, Quraysh is an important tribe. Now, after Allah protected the Kaaba under the leadership of Quraysh, now people said Quraysh are the people of Allah. Right? So they started to love Quraysh even more so now. And they started to love the Kaaba also even more so. Right? So their love for the Kaaba increased and their love for Quraysh also increased as well. Right? And this, of course, increased the status of the Prophet, the status of everyone uh, who, was, uh, who was affiliated to, to Quraysh as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq to practice, to convey. And of course, based on this year, this is the last point, inshallah. I know we went a little bit over time. Based on this particular incident, the Arabs began to mark their calendars. Okay? Remember how sometimes the Christians, for example, when they're doing their calendars, they say after death, before Christ, right? 
Uh, and since a lot of the world uses that calendar, we end up saying the common era instead of after death, right? So, for example, we say after the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? Age after the hijrah. So the Arabs they started to mark their calendars the year of the feel. Okay, that was the first year. So they would say two years after the year of the feel, three years before the year of the feel, the the elephants, right? And it was in this year in which Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was also born. So this incident was almost like a precursor that just as Allah Azza wa protected the Kaaba from this, Allah Azza wa will protect the Ka protect the Kaaba from any other evil, including paganism that had become prevalent within Arabia at that time. And Allah's Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent at that time, uh, which was in the year five. Uh, 70. He was born in that time. But of course, uh, his prophethood will be around 40 years later. We'll talk about uh, his life from the beginning of his life, the birth, all the way till the prophethood, inshallah, in our subsequent lectures. So inshallah, I hope to see you all tomorrow. Bi'ithnillah, jazakumullahu khairan. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.